from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our audience worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome now to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. Stocks are rallying today, I'm happy to say. There is renewed hope that Congress is finally going to pass that large stimulus package down on Capitol Hill. Let's get a check on those markets, and joining us right at the top is Kaylee Line. So, looks a little good. It does look a little good. There's a lot of green on my screen. All the major averages here in the U.S. up around 7%. Of course, we hit that limit up in futures trading overnight, and we've really just been going higher ever since. A lot of hope that the stimulus is finally coming coming from Capitol Hill. Of course, we haven't gotten it yet, but the market is kind of placing their bets. One caveat I would say is that this isn't unusual that we sell off on a Monday and rebound on a Tuesday. We've seen it pretty consistently over the course of the past several weeks. What I would note that's different is that you're seeing confirmation of how risk on the rally is when you look at other asset classes. Volatility is actually more subdued. The VIX is lower for a fourth straight day, now at a 55 handle relative to the 80 we saw last week. That indicates that maybe things are getting a little calmer, a little more orderly. You're seeing money coming out of the bond market, the U.S. 10-year yield up about four basis points and actually some dollar weakness. The dollar is down for the first day in 11. That shows some of that dollar funding stress that was present in the market and maybe is easing a bit. All of those things should support this rally. But of course, we do have to wait and see if we do get that stimulus. Yeah, that we're, we're promised daily. But we had both the Speaker of the House and the Majority Leader today saying, oh, it's coming. It's coming. Just a matter of hours. We'll hope that that's true. How broad based is this on the equity side? Is it pretty much across the board or are some really standing out? It is pretty much across the board. If you were to look at the IMAP function on the Bloomberg term, you would see that everything is green. And what's interesting is it's the most beaten up sectors that are actually leading this rally. Mm. Energy is on pace for its best day since 2008, up about 10%. And some of the other stocks that have lost something like half their value over the course of the sell-off, like airlines, are actually leading the charge. So you're seeing some buying of those dips. Some of those stocks that valuations are relatively quite suppressed at this point are leading the rally today. Well, well it's interesting. On the airlines, that could be tied to the bill because re reportedly there's going to be some help for the airlines in there. But, but energy is a bit different. Actually, I wonder if that has to do with anticipation of global uh, demand or whether it's things like Chevron saying we're really going to eliminate our stock buyback program and by the way, we're going to cut our CapEx, I think by 50% or something like that. Yeah, they were going to cut it $4 billion from their plan and eliminate that $5 billion share buyback plan. And the stock was actually higher on that. Investors seem to like that companies really across the board, not just limited to energy, are taking that kind of action. We're not going to issue guidance. We're going to pull back on our buybacks. That seems to be kind of the status quo. I don't think it really disrupts the market anymore because, again, we still have the coronavirus out there, stimulus yeah. or not, so a lot remains unclear yeah, at this there point. Is that. That's a rather good point. Okay, thanks so much to Kelly Lyons now for that report on the markets. And I'll stay on the subject of that massive spending bill that everyone's waiting for. And thus far, we haven't had it. We welcome now from Washington, Terry Haynes. He's founder of Pangea Policy, and he joins us on the telephone. So, Terry, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I won't hold you accountable for it, but give us some sense of what's between us and having that bill actually pass. <laughs> thanks for not holding me accountable, David. Uh, I, I think it's pretty much all over but the shouting. Uh, a lot of ministerial details to go. Uh, you know, the Speaker Pelosi's uh, the late in incursion into this process added a little bit of time to it. But I think there is uh, complete understanding uh, that, that things need to happen as quickly as possible. And I understand uh, uh, this morning in public when uh, pushed back upon about whether you could get this done tonight, uh, she didn't object to that. So it's, uh, you know, sort of Tuesday late, uh, early Wednesday, I think, at the absolute latest. But this thing gets done pretty quickly. Of course, most people are saying, let's just get it done, whatever it says in there, as long as there's some money coming our way. But have the Republicans come her way some? I mean, there were a couple of basic categories, I think, of issues, which is, number one, are we really helping the working people enough? Uh, and that's through things like uh, unemployment insurance and things like that. And the other, we want some strings on the money going to the corporations. Have the Republicans moved in her direction? Oh, I think they have, yes. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, one of the things Democrats and uh, Speaker Pelosi have been saying uh, pretty much has, has been uh, there needs to be more accountability for that money and more oversight for that money. Well, Congress, of course, has the ability to oversee what Treasury does anyway, but, uh, but they'd like some additional oversight. And, uh, you know, to me, that is uh, more of a ministerial detail than anything else. And uh, Republicans, I think, were, were quite willing to accept that, yes. Well, and the president himself has said he would favor restrictions on stock buybacks, one of those strings to be attached. But at the same time, you have certain people like uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts saying, I want a separate body created to really oversee this rather than trusting Congress to do it. Is it likely you're going to have something like that? Uh, I think uh, whatever Mrs. Warren might like uh, probably waits for another day. Uh, the, the, the broad outlines of this have been clear for some days. Uh, what, uh, the, what the House 
Democrat priority has been has been clear uh, for the last 24 to 48 hours. Uh, I think anything more elaborate, uh, if it gets set up in the end, uh, may have to wait. I would look for uh, for separate bodies and things like that. Though I would look uh, for strong Republican opposition to that. Uh, you know. The, they don't like the CFPB, which Mrs. Warren takes credit for. Uh, they're certainly not going to like yet another independent body. Yeah, fair point. Uh, so, so, Terry, it's one thing for Congress to pass a bill and the president to sign it. It's another thing for cash to get into people's pockets. Do you have any sense about which parts of this bill might actually get cash out into the economy, economy the fastest? Well, I think the, uh, the, the, the short the, the rule of thumb I would use is the more direct the, uh, the, the assistance, the faster it works. In other words, uh, Secretary Mnuchin has been saying for a week or more that his goal has been to, you know, get people uh, checks cut immediately. And so I think that happens. Immediate assistance to a variety of industries, I think, happens. Uh, it will take a little bit longer for loan guarantees and the like, largely because there are some hoops that companies have to jump through in order to get those. Uh, and uh, so you're going to – there's going to need to be a an expedited application process and an expedited – uh, acceptance, uh, that's going to add a few days to things. But uh, but everybody has been focused on trying to get the aid out as quickly as possible, uh, which is exactly why the major stumbling block ends up being the legislation itself. So, Terry, this is the third bill now to deal with coronavirus, by my count. When are we going to have Bill 4 as a practical matter? Are they working already? Because everyone seems to agree this is necessary, but it probably is not sufficient in the end. I think that's right. I would look for Bill 4. I mean, today, and, you know, things change. Uh, I had had, uh, a week ago, I had had uh, seven, to, seven to ten days for this bill, and, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're going a little bit faster than that. So I would look for it in a period of weeks. Uh, what, they need, uh, what they need to see is how quickly uh, this, right, this bill, the third bill, writes the ship. Uh, if it does, they can take a little bit longer. If it doesn't, I think what you see is you see Congress uh, coming back very quickly and, uh, and, and trying to readdress this. Uh, but from the beginning, there has been bipartisan agreement in Washington on doing whatever it takes, and, and I expect that to continue. Okay, Terry, thank you so much for joining us. Always good to have you with us. That's Terry Haynes. He's Pangea Policy Founder. And we turn now to Ritika Gupta for Bloomberg First Word News. Ritika? Thanks, David. The Tokyo Summer Olympics have been put on hold. Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and the International Olympic Committee have agreed to delay the Games by a year because of the coronavirus outbreak. It was scheduled to begin July 24th. The Eurozone is strike sinking into the biggest economic crisis in its history. Measures to contain the coronavirus pandemic have brought much of the business world to a standstill. IHS markets gouge of private sector activity plunged to the lowest since the index was started. That was more than two decades ago. The price of oil rallied for the second day in a row. Brent crude is approaching $28 a barrel. The Trump administration says an alliance with the Saudis is one idea under consideration to stabilize prices. And China is set to lift the lockdown over the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic. Transportation will be allowed to resume in the city of Wuhan on April 8th. And residents will be allowed to leave the city and the surrounding province. Last week, the province reported that new infections had dropped to zero. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Ritika. Coming up, he is the man at the center of a huge effort to get protective equipment to healthcare workers. We're going to talk with Mike Roman. He's the CEO of 3M. That's next. And this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. We're back now with Mike Roman. He's the chairman and CEO of 3M Corporation. And what we were talking about before we lost the connection there, Mike, was the N95 masks that 3M is so crucial to production of and are, in turn, so crucial to our healthcare workers. What's your capacity? How many you can produce per week, per month, per year? Yeah, so, David, thank you for having me on. Thank you for getting me back on. That N95 respirator is at the center of what we are focused on, our priority Start to the safety of our people, but the safety of the public is critical. And we have a unique responsibility 
to deliver those N95 respirators to the healthcare workers on the front lines. And we, uh, we accelerated to maximum production globally, including in the U.S., uh, beginning back in January, and we are currently operating at that level. We produce 35 million of the N95 respirators each month out of our manufacturing facilities in the U.S. Uh, we have prioritized those respirators for the healthcare workers in the front line. We uh, can uh, we can continue to excel, add to that capacity. We're at 35 million today, and and really delivering to the greatest needs around uh, around the U.S. We're, we're all becoming familiar with these numbers now. We hear from the president, from the vice president. Give us a sense, if you need to increase production, because it sounds like right now we can't get enough of these things, uh, how long does it take for you to increase above that 35 million uh, range? Well, we're working with government partners, with other companies, looking at all ways to increase our capacity. We have made investments. Our, you know, our strategy has been to keep idle capacity available for times like this. We've brought all that online. We are adding to that with additional investments that we had in the pipeline. And then we are working to continue to add capacity further out as we go through the year. So it's, it's kind of in stages. Near term, we can add some incremental capacity. We're working with other companies to look at alternatives to add even more to that. Uh, so we, we are striving to add more each month. And then as we get out later in the year, we think we can increase significantly with uh, additional uh, production lines that will come on online for us. Mike, give us a sense of the relationship with the government here, because we have heard about 3M more than once from the president, from the vice president. As I understand Vice President Pence actually went out and visited you at one point. Uh, is this a matter of cooperation, support? Are they invoking the Defense Production Act with respect to 3M? Well, we've been working very closely with the government. We've been working you know, with, uh, with Vice President Pence from his visit, looking at how to make sure that we can shift what have been the industrial N95 respirators into healthcare. So it was really appreciate the, the emergency use authorization out of the FDA and then the PREP Act amendment, which enabled us to be able to deliver our industrial respirators, that N95, to the healthcare workers at the front line. That was the first big step. And so we worked together on that. Uh, the Defense Production Act really has enabled us to work together on making sure we are getting the respirators to the most critical needs around the country. And our, our teams are working together with FEMA, with Health and Human Services, making sure that we are delivering where the needs are greatest. So it, it's a partnership that, that really uh, has been very effective as we've come through the month of March. Mike, you're right at the very center of a true national global crisis, in fact. What in your past experience may have prepared you for this or prepared 3M for this sort of unprecedented demand, not just demand, but need for the sa safety and health of the American public? Yeah, we learned, I would say, coming out of SARS and H1N1 that we, as a leader in providing these personal protective equipment solutions and, and really the respirators being critical center of that, that we needed to be able to lead in times of crisis. And so we made the decision to invest in capacity that stayed idle under normal circumstances. Normally, a majority of our respirators, that N95, goes to industrial use, protecting workers in difficult environments. In times like this, we have to both surge our capacity, and we've almost doubled our output since the beginning of the year, as we came into the year expecting normal business demand. And then we, uh, you know, we, we are able to surge everywhere around the world. We manufacture in all regions of the world. So the U.S. was very important, and we ramped that up to the 35 million, but we ramped up globally to over 100 million uh, per month. So we are, we are surging everywhere around the world. Moving beyond the N95, there's something that I'm learning about called the Powered Air Purifying Respirator, which is the PAPR. There was an announcement that 3M made together with GE and with Ford and the UAW today. Explain to us what those devices are and what the nature of this joint venture is. Yeah, this is, I, I think it's a great example of how companies have stepped up. They've, they've responded to the call to action to do everything they can to help serve the public safety and the needs of the healthcare workers. This is a great example Ford reached out to us uh, to work together on anything that we could do to increase our capacity and, and the solutions we can bring to the market. And this powered air purifier is an area that it's, a, it's an important product for use in, in some of the healthcare uh, environments. And, and Ford can bring expertise. Uh, they can bring skills where it's needed most for us and help us uh, increase our production of, <clears throat> of those powered air purifiers. So it's a 
it was really, I'm, I'm really pleased with uh, Ford's response and the help they've been giving us. Uh, are there other possible joint ventures like that you may be working on or at least taking a look at that might expand our capacity for giving protection equipment to healthcare workers? Well, we're, we're looking at all across the uh, supply chain. What can we do to increase our capacity? So we're working with a number of companies. How can we increase the output of our lines? How can we bring new production faster? That's one of the things that we can do is get what would be a normal, a longer lead time to bring on new capacity. How do we shorten that? Companies are stepping into that. There's also the logistics side. Normally the supply chain is very efficient, but in times like this where we are we are changing daily our, our working environments. We, we are finding people that are stepping up to help us expedite our products. We now have the ability to ship directly from our plants to areas that we need uh, really expedite overnight orders that, that are critical to uh, needs on the front line. So it's been across that whole you know, supply chain spectrum and, and maybe most important in expanding capacity, but help all the way back to raw materials has been, uh, been very, very important the way companies have stepped up. Mike, give us a sense of who's deciding where these N95s or PAPRs are going, because we have a crying need for them. We hear from Governor Cuomo here in New York daily about the shortage of them. Who's making that decision about where these things go, because we do have a shortage? Yeah, <clears throat> so we're working with Health and Human Services and FEMA to make sure we are prioritizing uh, where they see the needs are greatest. We work directly with the hospitals themselves, the, the health care providers, and we're working to deliver on the greatest need, the urgency. We delivered uh, this over the last week, we delivered uh, now a million respirators into New York City, for example, responding to that urgent need there. We uh, shipped uh, over the weekend product into both Washington State and New York City that began arriving yesterday. So it's, it's really prioritizing where the needs are greatest and getting help from every angle on identifying that. Now we've we uh, and we we keep visibility right through to those those hospitals and those those healthcare workers on the front line. Mike, you also are running a very large corporation. You have something like ninety six thousand employees. You said earlier, first priority is the safety, health and safety of your own people, but also the health and safety of the American people. How are you balancing that at this point? Because we need your people in there manufacturing these things. At the same time, they're taking some risk being outside their houses. Yes, and we are we are managing that in our operations. We we've. That like every other company, we've been adapting as we've gone. We have uh, everyone who can work from home works from home. That's not practical in the factories where we're producing these critical safety products. And so we have procedures and operations that we put in place. Uh, we are we have a robust uh, planning process. We have uh, processes where we are keeping uh, having our, our own workers using respirators. We're implementing cleaning and disinfectant, disinfecting cycles, really supporting their safety in the factories. So there's a, a, a standard operating process that we put in place. We've escalated to the most critical safety levels for that. And that enables us to keep operating in those plants and, and other operations that are so important at this time. Mike, you're trying to strike that balance between the protection of your people and, on the other hand, really manufacturing things we desperately need. We as a country are going through a version of that right now. We heard from Larry Kudlow just this morning, the chief economic advisor to the president, saying, you know what, we think we have to start bringing some of the economy back online by, by the end of the month, which would be next week. What, what do you think about that? Where do you strike that balance more broadly for the populace? Should we be letting people back out of their houses, at least in some locations, for the sake of the economy? Well, when we put our focus on the safety of our people right now, we are, we are following all of the guidance that, that we're hearing from uh, and, and being directed from the government. And, and that's both uh, local, state, and federal. And we've been able to manage our, you know, our operations around that. And, and getting that balance, as you said, is critical. So it is, uh, it is unprecedented, that the challenges that we're facing, but it's something that with these kinds of uh, procedures in place, protecting our broader workforce, protecting the people in the plants, uh, we will continue to, to do our best to, to operate uh, in in support of the needs out there.
Okay, Mike, thank you so very much. I know we all wish you the best of luck. That's 3M Chairman and CEO Mike Roman coming to us on the telephone. And now let's get a quick check on the markets. Kayla Lines is back with us. Where are we green? Good news, we're still in the green. <laughs> of course, anything could change in this blink of an eye with this equity market, but we are still higher by about 6% or more on all of the major averages. I would just caution that one day of gains does not a recovery make. We're still down about 30% from the S&P 500's peak until now. And we have not seen back-to-back -back gains on the major indexes since we hit that record high on February 12th. So we'll see how sustainable it is if the market is as excited about the prospect of stimulus tomorrow as it is today. But for today, it is indeed exciting. Well, that's a good question. If they, in fact, get the bill through, will people be excited about that? Or is it sort of buy the rumor, sell the fact? Well, it's kind of a question of how much is enough at this point, yeah. because we've seen it, no matter how dramatic yeah. the reaction uh, of monetary policy, throwing the kitchen sink and more at the market doesn't always have a sustainable rebound. So we'll see what happens here. We'll yeah. keep a close eye. Somebody <laughs> said, take whatever number you think it is in the and double it. Exactly. It's basically been the pattern so far. Whatever, whether it's a Fed or Congress, it just hasn't been enough. Because again, there is still this unknown question. When you can't quantify the impact of the coronavirus, what it's going to have on unemployment, on jobless claims, on growth, we've seen some really dramatic, really drastic uh, downward revisions for U.S. growth. When you still don't have an understanding yep. about that impact, it's hard to know how much is going to be enough on the policy side. Absolutely right. Thank you so much, Kaylee, for being back with us. It's Kaylee Lines. Coming up here, we're going to talk with the man charged with making sure the last massive of cash infusion to companies was spent the right way. He is Neil Borowski. He was the inspector general for TARP. Remember TARP? Well, we have a new version that's much larger coming up. Neil Borowski is going to be joining us right here, and we'll talk to him about exactly what we should do to make sure the money is spent correctly. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says that the Senate is very close to passing the stimulus bill. He described it as being on the five-yard line right now. Joining us now from Washington is Laura Davison of Bloomberg News. We also heard from Speaker Pelosi saying it could happen today. But, Laura, we've heard this before. Is, uh, is it real this time? Uh, it seems to be more real this time, at least more real than it's been um, in, in the past week. Uh, Speaker Pelosi said that she's uh, optimistic they're going to get a deal. They've narrowed uh, one of the key sticking points that was really uh, a point of tension all day yesterday. This is having some oversight for that $500 billion fund for, for loans to go out to businesses as well as state and local governments. Uh, there previously in the, in the Senate version wasn't any sort of uh, mechanism to make sure those funds were being spent according to, uh, uh, to what the law was saying. So Democrats Democrats said, look, we want an oversight panel um, in Congress as well as an inspector general. And uh, Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin has agreed to that. And that's really allowed things to, to move forward uh, potentially as soon as today in a vote with a vote in the Senate. That is, a, that is a potentially a very large breakthrough if that happens. In fact, the other issue besides oversight, or some people say strings attached to the money going to corporations, was are we doing enough for the, the, the people who are the working class? Uh, have they beefed that up? Yes, yeah, that, that's also been kind of one of the, the issues that they've been working on. Uh, and Pelosi this morning indicated that, yes, the, the place that the bill is now has enough to help uh, workers have enough to help people who are unemployed. They've gr drastically expanded um, unemployment insurance, both the amount of the payments as well as long the, as well as how long those are going to go out. There's also direct payments going out to households in the most recent recent version. Uh, the Democrats were able to secure um, a, a change there. In the initial version, uh, very low income individuals wouldn't get a check at all. Democrats said, no, we want no phase in. We want everyone earning under $75,000 a year to, to get that check. That um, appears to be moving forward. So there's a lot of those things that were sticking points they've come to some agreement on. Okay, Laura, I really appreciate you joining us. From Washington today, that's Bloomberg's Laura Davison. Congress is about to approve that enormous infusion of cash in the U.S. economy and U.S. business. The last time something like this happened, there was a special inspector general to monitor how the funds were really being spent. Neil Borofsky filled that role. He is now a partner at Jenner & Block, and we welcome him now over Skype. So, Neil, thanks so much for being with us. You heard Laura's report. It appears we are going to have an oversight panel, which is something that the Democrats had really wanted. What are your warnings to Congress right now about what needs to be done? What would you hope to see in this bill? It is a remarkable amount of progress. So, you know, it was just yesterday when there was virtually no oversight provisions at all, other than a, a just trust me, uh, would seem to be the the, the attitude um, uh, from the Treasury Department. So this is this is this is a lot of progress. 
Um, but a lot of the devil, of course, is always in the details. Uh, it does look like they're going to be uh, empowering uh, Special Inspector General. I think my old agency, actually, uh, SIGTARP, is going to be repurposed uh, to oversee this, which I think is, again, a very positive development. That is an experienced agency that has the right level of culture. So all of that is important. But again, it is in the detail. Are they going to have the necessary access? Is there going to be um, components to make sure there is the necessary level of transparency? Before, uh, the idea was we wouldn't even know who the bailout recipients were, were for, for a period of six months, and that was going to be kept secret. That is anathema to any degree of, of transparency. If you want to avoid uh, corruption and political favoritism, uh, the things that are inherent really in any bailout. Remember, a bailout is just picking winners and losers uh, at the end of the day. And so you want to make sure you have an even playing field so that the companies that are deserving of relief uh, get it, not because they have a political connection, not because they play golf with their member of Congress, um, or because their lobbyists are fiercer, more powerful, and well-connected than their counterparts. If you want this to be effective and have the biggest impact on the economy, it's got to be a transparent level playing field. And most important, um, are these conditions and strings attached? Uh, I think one of the things, the real failures of the last bailout is that Congress wanted and the administration announced that the money was going to be used to increase lending and help homeowners. But when the, when the contracts were written and the money was pushed out, there was really no language in that that compelled it or even incentivized it. And what happened? those goals were abandoned. And so it's really, really important that whatever the policy goals are of this Congress and this administration, and if it's to keep people at work, it's got to be hardwired into the legislation itself and then into the loan agreements or grant agreements or whatever these things are. So, Otherwise, it's not going to succeed. Yeah, Neil, as you suggest, there's a slight difference on this one. That was with the banks and making sure they loaned money. This one appears to be with employers to make sure they keep people employed. But give us your expertise. How do you do that effectively without slowing down the whole process? I mean, you can't say you can never let anybody go because some people will necessarily be let go. Are there ways to do that so you can really expedite it and yet protect at least the, the really gravamen of why we're doing it? Well, I think there's a lot of different ideas floating around there, and I don't presume to be an, an expert on em employment contracts, and nor, nor do I uh, purport to be one. But again, it's it's just important to have that connection. And again, it doesn't have to necessarily be uh, compulsion all the time. It could be baseline and a certain level, continue your existing level within plus or minus certain percentage, depending on economic circumstances. You can incentivize it. So if it's a loan, if it's a loan agreement, your interest rate on the loan maybe can go up and down based on your employment level compared to a baseline. Um, there are a lot of ideas that are potentially out there, but it's not. But it's very, very important. And we saw this last time. Just because there maybe isn't the perfect solution doesn't mean there isn't any solution. And and they need to be creative. Uh, and you can't just walk away from these types of things if that is in fact what you're trying to do and what your stated policy goal is. If your stated policy goal is, which it really was with the bank bailouts, save the banks at any cost, we don't really care what happens to Main Street, that's what was in the heart of hearts of the Treasury Department back then, then okay, be honest about that and you don't have to worry about restrictions. And if the American people support that, great. But if you're going to have these types of aspirational goals, you got to hardwire them in on the one hand. Second, you have to have oversight to make sure that those rules are complied with. And third, you have to have a strong law enforcement effort uh, that accompanies this from day one. Because you push out $500 billion worth of honey, you're going to draw a lot of criminal flies. And if you don't have that in place and start thinking about anti-fraud provisions, conditions that are going to dissuade bad players from coming in, it's going to be a free-for-all and really, really hollow out what little faith American people have in their government right now. Neil, listening to you, I infer that one of the things that you think did not work last time is having some very specific guidelines about what you're trying to accomplish. In that case, we were hoping it was going to be loaning money. Turns out it didn't work out that way. So that's one thing you want to make sure is in this one. What did work last time particularly well that you want to make sure is in this time as well? Oversight. Um, I think it's one of the great successes. And and when, when I and that's not just self-congratulatory. I mean, it's a little bit self-congratulatory. Um, <laughs> But when you look at some of the things that, that, that just sort of have to be part of this, you know, for example, they're pushing out potentially trillions of dollars of, of, with Treasury backstop of the Federal Reserve. You know, last time when that was originally going to go out in the TALC program, which is being uh, revitalized, 
Um, again, this wasn't because of any now this is this wasn't anybody trying to do harm, but they wanted to roll this out with no anti-fraud protections, with the only protections being uh, credit rating agencies, believe it or not, as being the sole guidepost of what the Fed was going to invest money in. And the oversight entity came in. We came in and said, no, that's crazy. That's oversight. I mean, rating agencies, that's what just got us into all of this trouble. And we worked out a program that had strong anti-fraud provisions uh, and also had a law enforcement task force around it to scare away the bad players. And when you look at that program, it was a success. And it had, I think it had zero losses due to fraud. And so that's the idea here is you could take these ideas, but you have to pair them with really smart oversight and tripwires and deterrence, and that's how they're going to be most effective. What will not work? Hiding everything from view of the American people for six months. That is just an invitation for, for corruption, for self-dealing, um, and you're gonna close out good ideas, which is the other thing that really, really worked well, is that when the, when the government listened to the oversight agencies, whether it was us or GAO or the Congressional Oversight Panel, the programs got better, they became more effective, they became safer. It wasn't always easy, uh, but they did. And that's why I think that is another really important part is to have that transparency uh, so that the administration, Congress, the media knows exactly what's going on and we can bring those good ideas and change course as we need to. Okay, Neil, really appreciate that perspective, that historical perspective that's particularly applicable right now as we're looking at this bill. That's Neil Borofsky. He's the former Special, in Special Inspector General of the United States Treasury under TARP. For Bloomberg First Word News, we're going to go now to Ritika Gupta. Thanks, David. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said she's optimistic that Congress will reach a deal on a massive stimulus measure. The Trump administration has given in on a key Democratic demand. It agreed to independent oversight of a fund to support companies. Italy is considering imposing fines of up to $3,200 for those who violate the nationwide lockdown orders. Police may also seize the vehicles of anyone caught violating the restrictions. Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte has banned movements inside the country and shut down almost all industrial production. The current fine for violations is about $220. New numbers show just how hard the U.S. airline industry has been hit. Passenger traffic is down 86% from a year ago. The major airlines in the U.S. have scrapped several thousand daily flights and more are likely to be cancelled. General Motors is tapping its revolving credit lines. The automaker plans to draw down about $16 billion. GM also is suspending its guidance for this year because of the coronavirus pandemic. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Ritika. Coming up, with lawmakers reportedly on the brink of an historic $2 trillion spending plan, we're going to get the view from Capitol Hill with Senator Mike Braun, Republican of Indiana. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. We continue to wait for that historic spending bill working its way through Capitol Hill. We welcome now one of those charged with helping steer our way through this crisis. He is Senator Mike Braun. He's a Republican of Indiana, and he comes to us today from Capitol Hill. So, Senator, thank you so much for being back with us. I want to talk to you about bringing the economy back, something you and I talked about last time. But first, let's talk about this historic spending bill. What is your sense of its magnitude, whether it's come through, and when? So its magnitude is going to be in the range you've been hearing. And uh, sadly, two major points. This should have been done on Sunday. I think when uh, Speaker Pelosi got back in town, she might have tried to commandeer the whole package. We had unbelievable bipartisan task forces where we all thought it was done on Sunday evening. And then we started to see the laundry list. I think that was a mistake on the Dems' part. And if we have been holding this thing up, for full transparency on the most important piece, the Emergency Stabilization Fund, in this day and age, you need full transparency. And I heard that just got across the finish line. I think our side probably, maybe uh, Secretary Mnuchin was uh, working too hard for that. Yesterday, I got together with four or five Democrats, and at that level, there were three issues, state and local government support, 
uh, plussing up the hospitals, they're the first line of defense, and then the transparency piece. I said most of us Main Street Republicans would be okay with all of them. Interesting. But that transparency potentially is quite important, as you suggest, right? Because last time around with TARP, there was a lot of second guessing after the fact. We didn't really know where the money was going. Should be fully transparent in the business of government, especially here, on everything you do. And just because it's on your side something you want to do, transparency is the key to everything working right to where you get held accountable. So as we've talked about before, you're a business guy from Indiana, besides being a United States senator. If this thing does get through and the president signs it in the next, let's say, 24 hours or so, how fast will the money actually get into the economy and where will we see it first? Okay, so this is a difficult conversation because all along I've said you've got to tamp the disease down. I've also, I think, been the first Republican out maybe a week ago on a floor speech that come day 15, we need to take all the things we've learned about the disease itself and the economic impact and then start to tailor our approach. And that's why it's so important to get this across the finish line because that would threaten what we do next Monday on having the flexibility to maybe lighten up a little bit in places where we can do that. We cannot systematically shut the economy down. We got to make sure we flatten the disease without flattening the economy. And that was a tricky model and a tricky balance from the get-go. I feel good that we're going to get there and we'll make the right decisions. Well, Senator, but this is important today. Yeah, you and I talked about that last week, actually, after yeah. you've given that speech on the floor. And you said, you know, we've got to be a little careful. We don't kill the patient to save the patient, basically. Exactly. We now are hearing that from the President of the United States a bit. And in fact, we heard it from Larry Kudlow just this morning, the President's chief economic advisor. What is your sense? Are we going to start backing off on some of, I guess it's the guidelines, the presidential guidelines he'd back off on sometime next week toward the end of the month? Yeah. We've learned a lot about the reason this nation has got high anxiety. You've got the ticker tape of the coronavirus up in the corner. We've never seen anything like it. It came out early with a 3 to 4 percent mortality rate. I think even Dr. Berg said it's going to be under 1. And if you took all the real cases we had here, it's probably going to be closer to the flu, but it's very contagious. we got to take it seriously. But on the other hand, there will be irreversible damage if we keep cascading an economic shutdown. And you, you'll probably need it in New York and in areas of population density until you get further down the trail. In a lot of the country, though, you ought to probably take a different approach. Be entrepreneurial about it. Take all the information we've learned about the disease. And I hope that we do start, you know, getting the economy back to normal. Many people have got want to do that. That's where we need to go as a country. But we need to tamp the disease down as well. You make a terribly important point, which is there's differences region by region. We just had Governor Cuomo giving a, a news conference a short time ago, and he said, we're doubling the rate in New York City every three days, and that's not slowing down. So as a practical matter, this is not a federal government call, isn't it? Isn't it really up to the, think, to the, to the no, governors? I think, I think like everything, and including here, some have asked for a mobilizing on a national basis. There needs to be direction from here, but my observation is things always get done better and more efficiently when you're doing it at a lower level of government. And I think Governor Cuomo has been doing it just right for New York. That's ground zero. It's where 40 percent of our cases are. And there I'd put absolute emphasis on tamping the disease down. In Indiana, we're mostly a rural state, have had relatively few cases. Maybe Indianapolis. Our governor did do a statewide shutdown for two weeks. And uh, I think here come next Monday, all of that needs to be reevaluated re across the country. Just be smart about what we've learned from both the disease point of view and not killing the economy. Okay, Senator, thank you so very much for your time today. That's Senator Mike Braun, Republican of Indiana. Coming up here, we're going to hear the other side of the Capitol and also from the other side of the aisle with Congressman Andy Levin of Michigan. This is Bloomberg.
This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. Democratic Congressman Andy Levin of Michigan called early on for the president to invoke the Defense Production Act, something that the president has now done. We welcome Congressman Levin on now over the phone. So, Congressman, thank you for joining us. Are you satisfied that the president's doing what needs to be done with respect to the Defense Production Act? Uh, no, not yet. I'm really encouraging him in a bipartisan way to use the full powers of the Defense Production Act to engage in a really big patriotic effort, our private sector, to produce the ventilators, the respirators, the gowns, everything we need, the testing capacity to get this pandemic uh, under control much better. And I think a lot of our companies are eager to pitch in, but this is a case where nothing but coordination at the highest level uh, will suffice. I mean, this is a flat-out emergency here. We've got hospitals in my area that are already using almost every ventilator they have. And if our cases keep doubling every few days, I just don't want to see doctors right there deciding who lives and who dies among people gasping for air. That's just unacceptable. Yeah, so we've got to act quickly. Absolutely. Do you have a sense of where the private sector may not be quite stepping up enough? We just had the chairman and CEO of 3M on. And it certainly sounds like he's doing everything he can, not only to use complete uh, existing capacity on those N95 masks, but to wrap up more. Do you have a sense of where the choke points are? Yeah, well, the, the, the problem is that you need, you need to set go national goals and uh, timelines. So we need to make a decision as a country how many N95 uh, masks we need and by when. And then great companies like 3M can say, well, we can produce this many, and then we can get additional capacity to produce more. The same with uh, other, with ventilators and certainly testing capacity. I mean, one thing people need to understand is, even if we failed in the first instance to have enough testing, and so there's been a lot of community spread, we're going to come to the end of this first big wave, and the question of whether we'll be able to fully ramp up the economy will depend on whether we can have mass testing in the, in the coming weeks so that we don't have to shut everything down to prevent another huge wave of, of uh, you know, a virus outbreak. So we really need to, um, both on testing, on uh, protection, and on treatment, all three areas, we need a national response right now. So, so, Congressman, I could, turning from those three areas over to the economy for a moment, we're told we're likely to get a massive spending package out of Capitol Hill, perhaps as early as today. Uh, is it sufficient, at least for now, as much as we know? Not as far as I'm concerned, but I, you know, I've got to wait and see what the, the agreement is. But we worked super hard over in the House to put together a, a bill that the, the Speaker introduced it's a $2.5 trillion bill, uh, which, you know, weeks ago we would have <laughs> couldn't believe we would right. propose something like that, but it's a new world. And it really uh, does much more for small business, does much more for students, does much more for local governments, does much more for co pu public hospitals, community clinics, uh, all the companies, nonprofits, groups, and especially the, the people who are being hurt by this, uh, we need to get them money right now. And so uh, our bill is, you know, more targeted and more generous, and I hope that, that it's something like that is what emerges from these talks. Let me we'll ask you about something specific see. I think you know about particularly. You have a union background, union organizing background. Are we doing enough on the employment front? Because most economists are desperately concerned about what's going to happen with unemployment in this country. We're absolutely not, and I don't. I, we've been. I know that we've been pushing for the Senate bill to uh, not just beef up, David. It's not just about how much money; it's about doing it in the right way that actually gets it to people. So, for example, you need to increase the amount of money through the unemployment insurance system. But so many workers in today's economy of many part-time job yeah. jobs of gigged jobs aren't even eligible for that. So you have to put money out there in a way that gets to everybody uh, because, okay. you know, people yeah. are, you know, at, at grave yeah. risk of, of uh, you know, yeah. be, of, of losing their, their homes, yep. their, 
a lot their, of their their businesses, yeah, everything. A lot of work left to be done, but I hope you're going to get to see that final draft today because I hope you're going to be passing it. Many thanks to Congressman Andy Levin. He's a Democrat of Michigan. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to be joined by U.S. Labor Secretary Eugene Scalia, and we're going to have continue that discussion about what's being done for the workers. This is Bloomberg.